You're listening to episode number six with Skip Johnston, side hustle investor and rental property portfolio owner. Welcome to the Creatives Unite podcast, hosted by Alex Moore, former Hollywood actor and side hustle jeweler, and Wayne Ostrowskis, former professional athlete turned apparel designer and maker. Each episode will bring you inspiring stories and advice from creative business owners and side hustlers from all over the globe. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. What's up? This is Alex Moore and Wayne Ostrowskis, and we're here with Skip Johnston, the famous Skip Johnston. You might have heard him named in Wayne and I's podcasts earlier, but yeah, awesome to have Mr. Skip on here with us today. How's it going, Skip? It's going good, guys. <laughs> awesome to see you. All right. And, and talk to you. Beautiful. Likewise. <laughs> um, so just a bit of background. We got Skip on here with us today. Um, I've known Skip personally for gee, about 35 years, I think we said, and I think Wayne's the same and then we all became a, a group of, of, um, of friends probably a couple of years after that. Um, yeah, so Skip is, I'll let Skip talk about what's he's, what he's doing with his job. He's the best to explain it. And then what his kind of side hustle is. Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm Skip Johnston. I work for a company called EMD Digital in the United States and Canada, Merck Digital in the rest of the world. And uh, to most generically describe what my company is trying to do is uh, make science faster. And more specifically, what that means for me is I'm uh, the director of product and e-commerce on that. And we are developing a platform to make the exchange of scientific data uh, more common in sort of an internet age, just exactly what you would expect for your sort of consumer grade finance experience or, you know, buying delivery uh, dinner through DoorDash or or whatever you might expect on the science side. And then on the side hustle side, I uh, have had like a private group at my house for for years called the Barons Club, where we just talk about various business ideas, but also our personal cubicle escape plans, which is essentially how do we build enough side hustle income that we're not totally dependent on our desk jobs so that we can kind of do whatever we want. Um, And the way that I have sort of done that most lucratively has been through real estate and buying rental properties in a college town. I said I was kind of an aloof kid and like just innocent really in a lot of ways, but like definitely very aloof and knowing myself now, I know like how I'm wired and, but yeah, I mean, I was writing sentences all the time because like, I was just, you know, ADD and just bored in school, like constantly. And so like, I was never, all my grades, like through school, I didn't become a good student until college when it was only tests, right? Cause I would always, my grades were always the same. It was like zero, not, not turned in, not turned in, not turned in, not turned in, test, A plus. So I always loved the tests because it was like crunch time and this little thing. And also, like, I felt like I was sticking it to the teachers. Like, you've been giving me all this bullshit homework. You don't think I know anything. Mm, you're- I know all of this. And now I'm going to stick it to you by getting an A on the test. But like, really, I was sticking it to myself. But I thought I was sticking it to the man. Yeah. Um, but I would have to write sentences for like not turning in assignments. And... Uh, Mr. Huffman, uh, like his deal was, if you didn't do it one day, it doubled the next day. Geography, right? geography. Yeah. We had that class together too. Seventh period, weren't we in that? Oh no, we had the same teacher, but just you, different. I times. was first, and you were. That's seventh. right. I was gonna say that. Yeah, were you first? Yeah. You were opposite. You were. It was your homeroom. Okay, go ahead. 
<laughs> and then Mr. Hawkins, our band teacher, you know, he like if you forgot your instrument, you had to write sentences. And Hawkins. I was always I was always forgetting shit everywhere. I remember one time we were playing football after school and I left my instrument and all my books in the field like behind my house. And I didn't know where it was for like two or three days. But I just forgot it back there, you know? That I'm so glad you reminded me of this. You're right. That's who you were. You were just like it was never surprising, but always you know, you were always surprised, but it was never surprising. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so then, you know, the sentences thing, like it became another thing where it was like, and I know this about myself now, you know, but it was a, it was a challenge. It was like, okay, now you have to write a thousand sentences. Damn. You can't, you can't write a thousand sentences. Right. No. And the, their rules, they had the same rule, right? It was basically like your sentences doubled every day until you tapped out and said you wanted a detention. Oh. And I just refused to tap out. Yep. And so like my sentences just kept growing. And then, uh, so I would try and come up with these like systems. I remember like trying to write it in marker, like really fast and then smashing it onto another piece of paper to see if it would like transfer. And then realizing it was backwards and being like, ah, oh, man. But like, <laughs> It was just, you know, this, uh, this thing that like I've come to now recognize as like creativity. Um, but school was just so hard for me because it never, it never really gave me an outlet for that. Like I remember anytime there was an outlet for that, I would just do ridiculous stuff. Like I remember, you know, classic freshman biology, you need to make a cell project right and you can draw it if you're an artist or you can paint it or you can make it out of macaroni or whatever so <clears throat> i made my cell my nucleus was a trash can that i like put water in and spaghetti for yeah, dna i think i remember that and a and a garden hose for the cell wall and like i made everybody push their desks to the side <laughs> of the classroom and made the entire classroom my cell, you know? And like, now I've come to really appreciate that about me and have found, you know, things where I can bring kind of that attitude out. And I've realized that that's like a pretty unique thing that like a lot of people aren't like that, but at school, it was hard. Cause like, I knew I was a smart kid, but like I was getting D's and F's, you know? Mm -hmm. Dude, like, you share, we share that same thing. That's why, I, that's how I kicked it off is exactly what you're talking about. So, and I want you to keep going. I don't, I don't mean to jump in on you. I just want to say that is exactly, so like I translated that exact thing because that's what I'm getting at. You, you and I had that, you know, we started on that together and then, <laughs> and then I'd feed off of you and you'd feed off of me. And, and, and we, you know, we did it in different ways. You were a lot more, uh, you had a different, you, you, so what you just described right there is like, uh, there's a shock factor to it, right? Like there's like a, <laughs> a lot, like there's a big, ex, you know, explosive version of, of how you would do it. And, uh, and yeah, man, that's exactly what you described. I can think of so many other just, you know, things that you would, you would walk down the street, just like yelling crazy shit. I remember. And like, you're always carrying that trombone that, you know, the, the uniqueness of that, the, the idea that you are walking a trombone miles how I, you probably like the big, about besides like a tuba basically like the biggest instrument isn't it i thought a saxophone was bad but yeah skips tuba well, i'm not sorry skips trombone is like double the size of the so <laughs> yeah so i guess we have to we have to tell people so skip skip would uh think he missed the bus or even missed the bus pretty pretty regularly and then he'd always have his trombone i, I don't know why but then he'd walk home from it was at least two miles and I bet it was more than that if we looked it up, but you walked very far with the trombone home through the main roads, you know, main roads, like downtown six miles, how far? Six miles. <laughs> Is, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You're yeah. It feels like, uh, yeah, I, I was going to say five. That's crazy. So you do that all the time though. And then we'd pass you on the bus and be like, yeah, remember that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh man. I feel so sorry for that kid. So skip though, back to the, th the thing about, uh, so making work fun and shit. So I took that to baseball and like, man, you know how it is. You're, 
you're growing up and you're just, you know, um, a lot of people around, a lot of people doing this and that. And like, you, uh, you kind of can observe what's going on, but then like when you need to, you can kick that, that superpower in right there, whatever it might look like. And it probably just comes to you at the moment, you know, like I need to do something and kind of get this thing going and then you can just take it and run with it. Uh, it's funny because just a quick example of that, Skip, let me tell you this story. So for uh, Halloween at, at my work, two years ago, they had a Halloween contest. And I was like, night before, like, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, so I had done this thing where I, I like had a, a cult, I was like, join my cult was a t shirt. And then cult leader was another t shirt. And, and I have it actually, I haven't, I don't have anything posted with it online as far as that to buy it, but I, I've posted pictures of it on social media. So what I did was, is that I, and I'm looking at this picture of myself and this is what made me think of it. Right. So I printed off my work picture, which here, let me pull it and show it to you real quick. So like, like internally, this was my, this was my picture. <laughs> so that's an example. There, there's an example right there of what you just talked about. Okay. Totally. I yeah. got it. I, I wonder. Yeah. Is that a Tottenham? I, is that a Tottenham top? Yeah, it is. Yo, so, <laughs> yo, it's a dope. Uh, it was like on sale, but I love, I love orange. It was yeah. one of my colors at, at a time. And so I was like, dude, it's a nice, nice. That's color. not even their colors button. though. That's funny. No, it's not. You're right. It's buttoned to the top too, by the way, just make note of that. So, so skip, hear me out, dude. So, so I'm like, all right, like night before I'm like thinking in my head and uh, I printed it on a, on a, on a pink t-shirt and I had red, like red pants and I had a maroon undershirt, like a long sleeve undershirt. I had the beard going like this. And then I took these, uh, I took these like tapestries and I like wrapped it around my head with a rope. Like I was kind of like a moses -y, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, it wasn't a term, it was, but it was like, it was hanging to the ground and shit. And then, like chic. yeah, I mean, whatever. It's just like, I'm thinking like back to Moses, the Jesus days, right? Or something in that time yeah. frame. But then, and I put this on a stick and like so for the contest i walked around the and i wasn't like trying to be jesus or anything i was a cult leader right like it, it was just it was kind of like the guy from platoon when they like all lose it and then they start like it gets real tribal kind of feel i say tribal yeah. isn't like no i know exactly what you're talking about anyway i had to share that bro so i won 50 dollars for that nice. <laughs> most creative hey most that. creative most creative they, they had three categories and i i would bet you hold tight so it was one was best costume, one was most creative, and then I forget the other one. Doesn't matter. But I I would argue that I won all three of them. But they they, they that would have been an upset of a, of a place, you know. And it's like yeah. they, everybody voted, so I got most creative on on the deal. So that's all I ever get, man. I don't I don't win any of the other categories. But hey, I went out I went all out on it though, as far as just yeah, uh, totally, man. That's that was awesome. a. But you would you would have you know you are proud but you would have been proud to be there yeah and i'm sure funny, i love that picture it's a funny picture i appreciate you guys though that was cool man um, um yeah that's the best thing about uh covid meetings you know like <clears throat> i'm in zooms like 70 hours a week these days it sucks but the best part is that you can make your own backgrounds and i have photoshop yes i was <laughs> yeah there you go hey I love it. I love it. I think we want to pick back up. So Skip just showed us his a uh, couple of his team's things. And really, it was because we were talking about that, that funny factor of bringing life to the party. Yep. yep. It, it's probably just that simple, isn't it, Skip? Yeah. Totally. You don't have to be the life of the party, but you, you're, you're bringing the life and getting it going. And then other, others feed off that. You're, you've, I've talked about this a couple of times. I can think of many examples where you do that. You'll take it and run with it, right? that you're dancing you got a very it's almost a, a trademarked dance i don't know i don't you tell me if anybody else does that dance or did you get it from somewhere uh man like <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it actually started um in college um so we had one uh like one childhood friend he was in this frat right and is that, uh, is that Marcus? Yeah, Marcus. And um, I, I always, I always thought frats were ridiculous, you know, because, and I get them now. But like, when I was a kid, my only impression of frats was like Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> yeah. 
and um you know i just decided that any chance i had to mess with frats like i would and so like we would go to these parties and every time like i would come up with something to do just to i don't know this is this is before borat but like that's basically what i was doing right yeah the original and so, you infiltr- so, infiltrated it yeah you- so like this one party i went to and i was just in character a raptor the entire night um you know just <laughs> yeah <laughs> And then like another time I, I had a camera and this was like at the beginning of digital cameras or whatever. And I would just go around and I would just like take people's pictures or like take pictures of their crotch and then totally deny that I had a camera. And, uh, and then one time I made a, a mixtape of just Prince songs and I would just dance. And there was no dancing at these parties, right? Like, and uh, another, our roommate, it was because me, Mark, and this guy, Jason, all lived together. And we would, Jason and I got decided that when we got there, we were just going to dance um, until they kicked us out, until they, until they made us leave. So that that's what we did, you know? And now I look at it and it's like, kind of childish but uh it was you know just college silliness but um in that dancing it just you know people remembered it and then it like just became something that people asked me to do and like I'd go to weddings and you know I don't know I like I I think about some of these things probably more in depth than I should but you know, being a kid from the nineties, there's things that I love so much about like the time that we grew up and what sort of Gen X was, but I always like, I never really liked Kurt Cobain. Cause I always like, I didn't like the idea of like being, uh, aggressively countercultural, like that it was a war or something like that. Um, But like, I was really sort of interested in this idea of like, productive counterculturalism or something. Um, But, you know, I think it made a lot of things that are fun and cool for kids that grew up in that particular microcosm of time, not fun and cool. Like it wasn't cool to dance to Prince when you were 15 in 1996, right? Cause that wasn't, yeah. you know, that was what counterculture was like trying to, to move away from or whatever. It was almost like the, we were in the counterculture. Therefore the, you had to go another direction. Yeah, if you wanted I, to be different, we were wearing flannel shirts and band yeah. t-shirts and like, it wasn't, it wasn't cool to dance. Right. It wasn't, no. it yeah. wasn't cool to like, like wham. You know, and now there's been this thing where like, that's ironic and like, it has all these levels and I, I love all that stuff and always have. But you think, you think too, um, remember back to TP, which is, um, it was like the, was it seven years, uh, sorry, seventh and eighth grade, like the, it's like the place to hang out on like a Friday night for people that that are listening. Um, Yeah. yeah, so all all like these um seventh and eighth graders so 12 and 13 14 something like that year olds would go and you'd have like a membership and it was kind of like a safe place where they had chaperones and they had cheap pizza and video games and pool but then they had dancing on the top right and most time it's just people lined up around the dance floor until you might have slow dance with a girl um or like if some or if they played like smells like teen spirit then everybody just be like mosh pitting that'd be the only dancing wouldn't it it wasn't cool to like be out there just like busting a move uh to random music yeah and then you know our friends started getting married and like i saw that carry over into like weddings like the djs that come out and they'd be playing like (laughs) and there'd be nobody out there right and like this is people's weddings and i'm like oh man this sucks and so like 
you just get out there and make a total ass out of yourself and it like opens the dance floor you know like everyone then feels safe to to dance you know mm. true i love it it's good so you know same note so that was that was how it, you know your uh, your later years it, it manifested but when you were younger that's and i've told the story we haven't talked a whole lot about it uh, but I know that you just had your birthday and we, I put a little clip on there about how, um, so basically, you know, we're always together and, and, uh, and Alex and his brother, they'd be fighting. And I think to, to calm the tension or I made Adam mad and to try to like, you know, apologize and then kind of get him in a better mood. So everybody, yeah. Uh, I was like, I'll fight you, Adam. And then, and then it kind of started just like that. Well, then, skip and skip so skippy tell us if you have an earlier remind like memory of you doing what you just talked about right the dancing but this is like my first kind of one of my first remembrances of you doing that or starting that was the I, i'll fight you so so from there skip it, it turned into like i'll fight you i'll fight you we'd be saying that to each other and then skip i think skip came up with if fighting's what you do then i will surely fight with you okay so then then you started going and taking that to like you you walked around all eighth grade saying that to everybody at school in character all the time and 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 you can i'll let you kind of tell your version of that but like i remember people coming up to you randomly just people that i know like we would be friends with everybody but it's not like you you know hung out with them or talked to them all the time but i just remember people that i was like oh my gosh i don't you know i didn't know skip even knew that person they're coming up to skip saying i'll fight you and then skippy's doing it back to them and yeah, you stayed in that character. I don't know how long just because I can't, you know, you would know not better than I would, but it was a thing. Yeah, well, I mean, that was so crazy, too, because like, junior high for me, it was it was like exciting. And again, like I said, I was kind of an aloof kid. Same time frame, though, right? Of everything. Yeah, yeah. You about. And um, but like, you know, there was just stuff that happened in junior high that I was like, I don't know. I, I was, I was sheltered from, it. we went to this like super tiny neighborhood school and then we went to junior high and like fights, lots of, lots of fights and gangs. I mean, I get that they were like kids like trying to be older, but like even the idea that you would say like, I'm in a gang it would like, it blew my mind. And they like kids were having sex and like condoms on the school bus and like, our friends, like some of our friends started smoking. And I'm like, what is happening? But I mean, one of the coolest things about that whole thing was just like these ganks, these kids that literally said they were in a gang, right? Um, coming up and saying, I'll fight you. And, <laughs> and like me being like, oh, but like also realizing that it was this joke and that like, I don't know at that age too it was like a, a sense of protection for myself you know because like I was scared of that stuff and the idea that like you know I could joke with those guys also meant that those guys would never like jump me in the hall you mm -hmm. know what I mean you're friend you're being friendly with people yeah like and making them laugh and that's a powerful tool right? yeah God. and I you know I think I got a lot of that probably from my dad because mm -hmm. I you know I, I realize now how crazy this is but I didn't then that uh you know my dad would just literally have deep conversations with anybody at their level whoever they were wherever they were from like wherever we would go and uh yeah, I, I, you know, there's lots of people like that. Um, but to kind of grow up seeing that was, was just really cool, you know, like, yeah, my dad was just never shy to talk to anybody. He wasn't one of these guys that would like be a, be annoying you know you get mm -hmm. people that talk to you and won't let you go and they're like oh he had a good self he had he had good self-awareness no so skibby's dad so you're, you're you looked up to your dad you're trying to be like your dad in some ways to be I, 
I wait, wasn't wait. then. I certainly wasn't when I was a 13 year old. Yeah, yeah. Know? But like I now, you know, especially since like, you know, he got sick when I was younger and passed away when I was fairly young, like now being 40 years old, which is actually really cool because that's how old he was when I was born. Um he's for he was 42 when you were born? He was 40 when I was 40, born. Gotcha, gotcha. 40 also. I don't know where I got the two there. I know you're 40. I, I miss 42, it. like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, I got you. Uh, <laughs> explaining it to me like I'm 10 or eight. Like, what is yeah. the difference between why, why are there two twos? <laughs> no, it's funny that um, you say that about your dad, because I think, like you said, you looked up to him, but I think, I think we did as well. Um, yeah. Like my dad worked a lot and was like working nights and stuff so he was almost your dad was almost like a father figure or uncle figure to all of us really mm -hmm. you know what i mean because he kind of always was like hanging out like outside and you know we saw him next door you know because your grandma lived right next door to me so mm -hmm. yeah he's and like same kind of thing like he treated us like almost like he's same as you you know what i mean yeah. and when you talked about like kids smoking i remember i don't know if you remember this but it was around probably at the same time your dad gave us some like chewing tobacco. Oh yeah. And, um, and I remember, I think he just gave it to us and didn't tell us what to do. And I remember like taking it and like swallowing it and then like, Oh, and, like this, okay. is, this is disgusting. And then like, I think that was one of the reasons why I've never smoked is because of like, I was like the nastiest stuff ever in my mouth, yeah. you know, the chewing, the chewing tobacco. And like, I was just like, why would I, why would I want to do this? You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, no, it's funny you think back and, you know, he was definitely like a figure in my life, um, you know, as well in, in a different type. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, it was just all these things that I didn't, you know, and it's easy to glamorize, you know, folks that have passed you, you remember all the good and none of the bad, mm -hmm. but like, um, he really, you know, he just always treated me he treated me like a son but also like an equal and mm. you know I was only child so like who else did I have to talk to or hang out with and I was and, an only child too by the way and that's something that yeah. you and I we share a lot in common your dad loved music he and I'm not trying to jump yeah. in on you here but he he loved music bro and and uh he liked jazz and that was one of the reasons I feel like you played the trombone but I remember yeah. you and I were both very eager to get into music. And I remember our first school band, which we just saw a picture recently, right? Of me, you and Sarah playing. And I remember that day, which was cool. Yeah. But I, we just kind of got our instruments that day, right? And uh, and we all just got together. And we're playing like some sort of sheet music we had. And But I remember... Hot cross buns, baby. Yeah, yeah that sounds right. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, man. No, he and then he was funny. That was earth, like he was very funny where he had a lot of those funny sayings. So let's talk about those funny sayings because they're you, you're going to know more than I remember. I'll, I'll remember all of them, but you're going to remember them quicker than I do. Right. So I remember, you know, glad you got to see me whenever, you know, we're leaving. No glad smiling. No smiling. No smiling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, stop smiling. Oh, yeah. 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 No smiling. And then, <laughs> and then uh, we'd be riding in the car and he'd be like, he'd hit the horn right when he'd go, mer, mer, like he'd do this. <laughs> and then he'd try to, he would try to make you think it was something else. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, man, I, like, go ahead, add a couple more here. Sure. Uh, got dandruff. Some of it itches. Is one I remember. Like, uh, instead of like cussing in front of me or whatever. <laughs> um, got dandruff. Yeah, he would. He'd have like these like weird poems and. I stuff. see. I see. Said the blind man as he reached for his hammer and saw. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah. And, uh, so I saw this, this is kind of a non sequitur, but if you'll entertain me for a minute. Um, so there is this Nova, um, on PBS about, um, language and how our brains work and how actually, you know, a meme now is like this internet thing and it it is an accurate representation of a meme um but like a meme truly is like bigger than that and it's actually part of how your your brain works at like a fundamental level so like the alphabet are memes 
right? That we share to understand language. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, we just absolutely love internet memes and like share them. I mean, I think everybody does, but like, uh, it was so cool to just catch this random PBS thing on, uh, like language and how it develops. And it had these, uh, kids that, um, lived in, uh, somewhere in South America, but they were all deaf. Right. And, you know, it's like one of those sad, but like amazing perseverance stories of humans, but they would take all these deaf kids and they would just put them together in a camp and, but they would create their own sign language. And it was obviously different than American sign language, but these uh, scientists would like find them and discover like, oh, they created their own language. And then they would find other camps like this all over the world. And like people would create their own kind of ways to communicate or, or what have you. And uh, I just think about that and think about my dad and how he did those things and how, you know, it, it spread and how like we did that as kids too. Like we'd have all these internal sayings and like we would catch someone saying something funny at like a baseball game or whatever. And it would just, it would come like, it would create this camaraderie of like an inside joke of a meme, you know? Yep. And uh, it's just, I don't know. It was, it was such a cool thing to just like catch because it just put so do many dominoes in place for like, who I am and how like these things develop. I agree. Yeah, we, and, yeah, we, were, saying, we were part of that. Go yeah, ahead, Alex. Exactly. Oh, definitely. I was saying, that's what I was saying is we have, we've had um, a ton of inside joke type of things from just, you know, random stuff that we've seen and heard as we were growing up. It, it showed the magic though, of what that is though, Skip. Yeah. How And how you can, share that with other people which is what everything is you're not you can be alone as you want but you are part of everybody what well, like it or not and mm -hmm. we all share the same th traits and uh and and sharing humor together is great she's that's like laughing and smiling and that's what your dad was all about he was always yeah. trying to make he was always trying to make people laugh low-key in in his own way you know his own form of comedy and he was genius in that and i feel like i you know that's exactly what we were talking about earlier though, man, like taking that little nugget and just like giving it to everybody else and letting it live on. Cause yeah. it's not ours. It's not, you're in it, you know, we're not comedians professionally, but like, but I'm, you know, I think I'm pretty funny. And I know you are. And I know Ryan, and that's the thing like Ryan Wiggins shares that same piece. That's why we all appreciated each other. And, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that again, is like looking at these things in rearview mirror, they, they happen and you don't even realize why they're happening or why you're making some of the decisions that you're making. But like, I really think, you know, talking about like playing basketball or whatever, but like in, in high school, I sort of just really would magnetize towards people in different groups. And, and you, you know, Ryan was definitely one of them and he had it, his own like click, you know, mm -hmm. of, of uh, guys that he was buddies with and all those guys are awesome. Um, but, you know, like Ryan and I were the one that really hit it off and we were buds, but I wasn't like in his group per se. Understood. You know? I, I, same with me. And I think that's a, for a lot of people. We all share that too as well. You're right. And I, cause I remember that man, like you and I, we played basketball together. And then I remember though, you were in cross country and track of other forms and, and other things yeah. you, you, and you had your groups of friends and I had mine as well. And, uh, and it's always those one or two people though, that keep you together. Hopefully there's right. more than one. Right. But yeah. And, it, but, but so like the Ryan thing though, like same deal, like anytime I would gravitate when I would get in class, I would try to sit by the funniest person I could that I was going to laugh with right. the whole time. Because otherwise the class is gonna suck, right? <laughs> you go that like every every time, and then you'd be like, you'd have to sit alphabetical, or you'd have to they'd yeah, have a yeah. chart, and you're like, all right, well, it's gonna be a little harder, but we're gonna still do this. <laughs> yeah, buckle up, buddy. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and so Mr. Haskett's class, though, what I appreciated about that was that we 
the, he like, and I was looking back at, I was thinking about this. What was, spe- he actually invited that. He did. He, he, he understood it as well. And he was hilarious. Yeah. But he like, he let us, he really let us do our thing. And there was no, we were all, uh, everybody was kind. That was the only rule. I think just be nice to each other, but like have a good time. Yeah. And be respectful. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've all had those teachers that like, don't care and let it be a free for all. Right. And it wasn't that at all. It was his classroom. He was teaching, we were learning, but like, I mean, he was an amazing teacher because you're nailing it. He recognized that and instantly incorporated it into his curriculum. Like seamlessly, I, you know, you only recognize it looking back that like, that's what he was doing, but it was brilliant. And that, I mean, that class was so fun. There was just like a power row of us on that back wall of like the funniest kids in school, you know, in our opinion, no offense. <laughs> uh, we're, we're right, man. Yeah. <laughs> So, so um, you, real quick, I want to just, Alex, hold that thought. Uh, yeah. that, that shit right there that reminds me of like what rock stars do. That reminds me of like what, uh, and I could say like that like about pro athletes as well. It's like you, it's kind of like a mic drop in the sense that like you, you rock it out, you do it the right way. Everybody is feeling vibrant when they're done. And mm-hmm. that's what, it's so like, you know, somebody hits a game winning shot you know and and but it can be done on smaller scales like a classroom mm-hmm. yeah that do you do you follow me there that's 100%. what he was doing yeah and that's where um yeah i uh, know i that the is- high you get the high you get from when you perform and the high you, so like i played baseball I played in music too. And like, you remember Skip, like we were competitive with music. Like I was first chair and I'm not bragging. I'm just simply You're saying. You're competitive. I, I, I am competitive. competitive. No, I am. I'm a competitive person. I just wasn't, I, I mean, I love music obviously, right? But uh, there is um, the practice and like discipline <laughs> that, I just didn't have at that age, yeah. you know, and I didn't, again, like now I know so much about myself. I didn't know how I was wired. I didn't know how to like be my, and that's what Channel. actually I learned that in cross country, you know, because cross country to me is, is such a pure sport in that you're just, it's just running as hard as you can for as long as you can. Right. And like, there's a um there's a a beautiful symmetry and i I know you have this in other sports like uh whoever the bulls coach i forget his name phil jackson yeah phil jackson the peripheral opponent right but like cross country is is an an ultimate peripheral opponent game because Mm -hmm. you are in your head competing against other people but mostly yourself right like you are tracking constantly how you're doing against yourself in a, in a way that is uh, camaraderie with your teammates, especially, but even your opponents, but then also they are your competition. And it just, if, if I, I don't, I don't think if I didn't run cross country, I don't think I ever would have got myself together in a way that's allowed me to be, as successful as I am, you know? And uh, yeah, that's just like a gift that I think you can only get in sports and then you can bring it to other places. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I think it only comes from, from there. I think the best college, go ahead, Alex. Alex, I think it's it's funny that, um, yeah, when you say that, about running and stuff, especially in cross country when you're racing or any type of race, because I've raced triathlons and things, is that, yeah, you do have opponents, but lots of times you're just fighting against yourself just to finish the damn race and you almost forget about the other people and you don't care what place you come in or you just want to get it done. You know what I mean? So you're actually, yeah, you're like, I like how you said that your biggest opponent is your own self and in regulating yourself to, to finish and you just hope that you finish above everybody else hmm yeah absolutely and i mean that's 
Yeah, that's that's what I think that clicked for me in a way that cross country forced me to do in like a, a mental understanding, but also a physic, physical mm-hmm. understanding that to me, almost everything is a cross country race mm-hmm. now in my brain. Like, you know, I, I travel a lot for work or I used to, and every, every trip was like a cross country race. You know, it was like there was the beginning. It was exciting. You're, you're pumped. You've trained for it. There's the middle where it's like, you're just doing the work, you're in the zone. And then there's like the beginning of the last third where you just want to go home. You just want to be done. But then you see that finish line and it's like this new thing kicks in and you're, you're like endorphins kick in and you finish the race, you know? And like every project to me run is a cross country race now, you know, of like that beginning, middle and end where you just have to like, there's a point where like, it's you versus it's the best of you versus the worst of you, you know? And like, who are you going to let win that competition? And the worst of you wants to quit. Yeah. Adversity challenges. Yeah. What is, you know, every challenge looks a little different. We could go on and on about that. And one point I wanted to make was out of all that skip is that I've recognized this and that's why I'm, and I'm sharing it. And the Haskett, Mr. Haskett example is a great example, but that and what you just talked about with the cross country and finishing and how you feel when you're done. So like the whole, the rock star or the sports or the, the comedy or the getting something done with your team at work or whatever, that experience and that high and that like place that you can create, like I chase that high all the time with everything. That's why I'm talking. That's why me and Alex are doing this. That's why I do my stuff on the side is like, you're always chasing that, that high. Yeah. And it's, and it's endorphins and all that stuff. And you're not looking for like, it's not the praise necessarily. It's just the like, you know, like if you skip, you guys knock out a challenging thing at work, like me, I'm in sales. Like if I sell something, it's a great thing. But like, you get that same feeling, that little win, that little win, right? Chasing that little win. Absolutely. I mean, I could, I could talk forever about what I'm doing at work now. And, uh, like, you know, it's, it's not, it's not me. Um, you know, I'm on a team and I've been really, really blessed to work with like some truly brilliant people. Um, but yeah, like we're, we're chasing something that I think can make the world better. And every time we get closer to that, it's, uh, it's like, super invigorating super exciting and it's not something that you know is going to be easy to do um and if it was i wouldn't want to do it right like that that taps back into the why i struggled so much in school like i didn't want you know a thousand sentences by tomorrow i was on the math team in sixth grade with a d in math because i didn't want to do (laughs) homework you know but when it came time to like take the test I came out in top five, you know, Hmm. and, uh, but like, there's a part of that that's laziness, right? Like part of that was my worst self, but no, like nobody, I mean, people just, you have to be ready to hear it too, but like, nobody really told me that they just told me my whole life that like, I didn't work up to expectations. I don't, I didn't (laughs) really know what that meant. I didn't know how to like push myself and work to expectations until cross country, you know, that's great, but I don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's uh, I think, I think we all heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause you're still going to have me sit here for like an hour, you know, like one of the best things, uh, and this will actually get into the rental properties actually. So maybe this is a good place to go, but, (laughs) um, I just realized, uh, like in my late twenties, early thirties that there are no speed limits, you know, like there are challenges and there are adversities and, you know, I don't want to get on too big of a diatribe um, on some of that stuff. And I don't want, but I do want to say that, like, I don't want to diminish the challenges that that some people have, but all of us had very, um, none, none of our families were like super well to do, but you know, we had very, very gifted childhoods. 
um, I think, to prepare us to do whatever we wanted to do. And not everybody has that, right? Like some people have to overcome more adversity than others. And I think, you know, uh, I'll say you can definitively draw some of those lines sometimes on race. And that's, that's a real tragedy. Um, but despite all of that, there, there still is sort of this, um, there are limits that we all have um, that are put there. There are guardrails, but like none of those rules are actually really real, right? Like if you get it into your mind that um, you're going to break um, those rules and break those speed limits, you can. And I think people wrongfully kind of say, oh, well, like, you know, anybody can do that. Look at look at this one person that did it. It's like, no, I mean, that person climbed their personal Everest. Like just because they got into their mind that they could do it doesn't mean they weren't unfairly disadvantaged, right? And whatever it was. But I think all of us were, were very advantaged. And, um, you know, I just came across a couple of voices at the same time that like really articulated that for me. Um, and... Uh, you know, to kind of tie it like all together, you know, one of my personal favorite comedians is Andy Kaufman, right? Because he really just did it for the love, you know, like he would, after working on taxi, he would just go wash dishes because he thought it was funny, you know? And like, yeah, that's good. Point. I love that because like there was, you know, if you talk about this challenge or the resistance or like, he he recognized even in comedy that like some of the hardest parts are going to be yourself and he, like if it was funny to him then it was funny and that was good enough for like the concept and i i didn't know how to articulate this but there's a book that like articulates it awesome that i highly recommend it's called the war of art um and it's it's super easy to read they're like paragraphs but they're basically like riffs on this concept right um and uh i didn't read this book at that time but it was referenced by so many people that i was reading that i did eventually go read it but one of the books was this book called linchpin by seth godin and he wrote another book um called uh fixing school and i was a educator for a while right before i i just started and so much of what was in fixing school resonated with me that it really, really opened my mind to the idea that I had been living with the speed limit like my entire life that wasn't actually real. And so one of the quotes that he says in this uh, fixing school book is um, every day my job is open book, open note, and open group but none of the questions are defined. Why isn't school like that? And um, that just like really made a light bulb go off in my head that like, yeah, that that's life, you know, is like, I can ask people that are smarter than me for help. I can go to books and like, you know, you were joking earlier about the library, but like, man, like I just remember living at the library as a kid. Um, and like, once you, it sort of clicks that you don't have to, um, do the program, uh, that, that's such a powerful thing. Right. And like, that's what I mean by the idea of like productively countercultural, like there's nobody that says you have to do division in fifth grade. Like you could do division in third grade if you want. And, but I didn't know that. You know, like I would just go to school and I'd be like, this is what you're doing today. I'm like, I know how to do this. Right. So <laughs> I should have played drums because like the power of boredom, <laughs> you know, what you can learn at school while you're just waiting for school to happen in slow motion. Um, but then I came across this other guy who's like super famous now, um, but I don't think he was at the time. Uh, this guy called Mr. Money Mustache, and he runs this blog um, that that's kind of considered to start what's called the fire movement, which is 
financial independence, retire early. And it was the same kind of idea. It was like, you know, the plan for society is that you work 40 years and then you retire at 65 on social security and whatever you've saved. Like it doesn't have to be like that. And that kind of opened my mind to this, uh, this idea of, um, you know, side hustling or just, I mean, really just aggressively saving. Like you don't have to save for 65. You can save for 35 if you want. And then what you do at 35 is whatever you want to do. And so I, I started coming up with just these plans that I called uh, the cubicle escape plan. Hey guys, that brings us to the end of part one with Skip. Make sure to listen next week where Skip goes into the details of his cubicle escape plan, his investment strategies, and how he got into the side hustle business of property management. Thanks again, guys.